I would say that I don't really consider myself a collector, which I know will probably make a lot of people laugh. My choices are very utilitarian. Pretty much everything in here is in here for a purpose, and it's part of the big picture, the great stream of what my albums become. Hi, I'm Lisa Belladonna, and you're at my Appalachian recording studio deep in the Appalachian Mountains in the eastern United States. My daughter and I took a drive out here and as soon as we walked the property and just took a look through this house that was built in 1906 and it just felt like a place to start a new beautiful chapter. Before I came here I had this big sprawling downtown loft apartment and recording studio and it was really beautiful in a lot of ways but it wasn't a sacred space. You know, and when I started in electronic music, I had a little tiny four room house. I got so much done there. I just had this sort of, it just kind of had this cozy feeling. And it just allowed me to really dig deep into my work. I feel like this space was a continuum of, of that space. It feels like I'm made to do this here. Before the pandemic, I was traveling at least two weeks out of each month. And it's quite a bit, especially when you're a parent. But I would still find time to come in here and compose and sort of continuously process all the information that I would gather on my travels. And now I just feel like I've had this privilege to come out here and just really tell so many stories, musical stories, personal stories, things that bring me to the compositional palette that a recording studio can be. And that's what I want this place to be, is a fruitful impression of that. Okay, so on to the equipment in the studio. I love Focal monitors. I have two different sets of Focals in here, and they're amazing. Very easy to mix on, very accurate. But I have Alpha Eva 65s to dial up a mix on, and then I have my Alpha 80s that I use for playback and actually for performing when I'm dialing up sounds. My mixers are a pair of Allen & Heath GL2400s. I love them. They're very earnest, but they sound clean and powerful. And I have one modified in various ways. These all get connected to Apollo 16 by Universal Audio. I love to mix to cassette decks, and these particular cassette decks have what's called HX Pro encoding which is a sort of expansion process and it just does amazing things to synthesizers. Uh, one of the reasons I have so many channels is I have a lot of different synthesizers, but what I love to do is compose on the tape machines. I have three Fostex 80s and one two-track Fostex 20, and I usually almost always mix down final mix to the Atari MX5050. And then the desk is patch so it allows for uh, immediate switching between analog and digital. And so I always have 16 channels live of the digital, the Apollo, and that's what I love to use to record with. What really got me into music in the beginning was about age three, and I lived in Cleveland and stayed often with my aunt Doris and her daughter Debbie. Doris was a country and western musician, very talented, played many instruments. Debbie was a teenager, and this would have been in the early mid-70s, very into rock and roll, and she played me Black Sabbath Paranoid, and sitting right in between the speakers, that changed everything. It's amazing how timeless music can be when you, know, you get connected to music in such a special way that you know, almost 50 years later, it can still have that same exact, you know, energy moving incantation. You know, it's, it's something real precious. Well, I became in love with synthesis and electronic music at age nine. 
and I had a stepdad who had this really amazing record collection and beautiful eclectic taste in music. His name was Dana. And one afternoon, he played me both Switched on Bach and Sonic Seasonings, which is a completely different kind of electronic music, all by Wendy Carlos. And he had this big open wooden living room that sounded great and overlooked his pasture. It was really amazing. And it had a strong impression on me, but there was no opportunity to play a synthesizer or a keyboard of any sort for that matter. Fast forward to, I think I was 14, and I had a band that was trying to get something together, and there was a guy in the neighborhood who was like this Vietnam vet, really cool cat, and he would stop by and listen. He's like, you know, you guys sound good, but you need an organ. You know, he's like, well, I have one I'll give you if you guys want to come and get it. When we got it back to my place, it had like three manuals and a little mini like synthesizer and had a cassette deck in it that you could record ideas. And at that point, I had like a cassette deck, a Heath kit stereo cassette deck and a pair of microphones. And so I would experiment with recording the organ and then moving the microphones in different directions. And, and then I would play that tape back in the organ and then record it again. And that would be some of my earliest electronic music. This is um, my custom mothership, mostly Moog synthesizers. It is a eight voice polyphonic, 22 sequencers. It features 12 Mother 32s two Moog subharmonicons, and two Moog DFAMs. And then it's controlled polyphonically by keyboard or by computer interface via a poly and poly interface. And so this allows me to really do specific polyphonic patches. But a lot of what I use the poly in for is computer sequencing. It makes it so easy to immediately go from, from computer to, to analog so quickly and to be able to separate voices and channels in the computer is really handy. Then there's a row of dope fur synthesizers and uh, utilities, some filtering and phasing by AJH, and then two uh, old school ARP sequencers that were built and modified by Ben V. Horn, who you guys all know and love too. These come out into a pair of Fostex uh, 3180 spring reverbs. I love this thing. It's just, it's just amazing. This custom case um, setup, uh, it is uh, on a tandem power supply, and it was made by my technician, Peter Foley Electronics in Cincinnati, Ohio. And he's just a joy to work with. And pretty much anything that I dream up or I wish for, he makes it happen. Um, when the poly and poly isn't enough, I use uh, this Garfield Electronics Time Commander, which allows me to have different tape sync to sequencers, uh, to MIDI sequencing. It's a really powerful uh, old school studio tool. Uh, the 12 modules here get patched through one of my favorite pieces of gear in the studio, and this is the Holland synthesizer that um, I obtained through Fear No Evil Studios out in California. By the time I was 16, I was working in a jingle studio and just doing various musical things, you know, multi instruments and doing, you know, grip work, basically cleaning stuff and eventually editing tape, editing the commercials and doing sequencing and doing MIDI and doing things of that, you know, that was popular in the 80s. But in the back, they had a Fender Rhodes and an Arp Odyssey with a pile of dust on it. And I remember after a session cleaning the stuff off and experimenting with them and just that touch and that immediacy of shaping a sound and feeling the sound, you know, it made a remarkable impact on me. You know, I had this very profound experience and it was uh, astral projection and this was not under any sort of substance or anything like that. I didn't get into anything like that then. But I had this really intense experience where I heard and saw all these different sounds and all these different colors. 
aligned this other root system inside of me, inside of my muse. And, and then I sort of just took off and left all the other styles behind and left all the other instruments behind for a good 10 year period and just studied physics of sound and tried to find ways to relate it to music. I studied all the 20th century composers like deeply. And then I got to a point where I took all my keyboards out of the studio and only used modular synthesizers and tape machines. And I just did tape editing compositions. And then that turned into utilizing eight track cartridge tapes. I've always wanted my music to sound and feel the way 16 millimeter film looks. There is a color to it. There is a way that it saturates light, the way that it creates a sort of unique depth and distance in a shot visually. It's something I've always strived to, to capture on reel to reel and cassette and other formats. But I could just never quite get what I was after. One day I was in the studio, it was some real rainy, dreary day, and I was just experimenting with this mix. And at the time I had this, um, I still have it, but I had this um, like stereo in there for listening to mixes through, and it has its own 8-track deck in it. I had this big stack of blank 8-tracks I got with a reel-to-reel -reel lot. I just thought, well, I wonder what it would sound like if I mixed it to one of these 8-tracks. So. I mixed this piece of music down to the 8-track tape, cued it back up, put it back in, and when I heard it come through the speakers, there it was. It sounded like an old 16 millimeter film and it just had this tone and this color and this depth to it that was very special. When I compose music, I see it just as much as I hear it. I look at my arrangements as sort of landscapes or deep woods, mountain paths, you know, with all the textures and colors of the elements that surround it. And, you know, the 8-track tape saturates the sound in such a way and separates the stereo image in such a way that's extremely unique. And when you are changing through the programs, you get these different edits and these different sort of filtering systems because the tape's in a different spot of the head. 
and it's just a very unique, subtle way of creating another image and sound. This is how I would organize these programs. You might want to get a shot of that. Where's another one like that? Where I sort of have it spelled out. But you can see on each program, there's a, several different contrasts. Like I said, when I used to do this live, I used to have several machines and I would have things on reserve and ready to roll. Some queued up, some at random, and some in the back of the room, some in the front, some in different rooms in the venues. And then, you know, when the set's over, Nothing's better than Miles Davis' Life of the Fillmore. <laughs> A lot of people ask me, why do you have so many tape decks? Is it just for looks, because it looks cool? That's usually the comments I get all the time. Uh, the reason I have so many tape decks is because sometimes I might do one section of a piece of music here, and then on this machine, another section of a piece of music and have it ready. Or sometimes I might want things to be just submixed, like effects. Um, just certain things that I want to have tape manipulation or different speeds. Or I just want to have a very specific kind of filtering. Then I'll use the two track for that. Um, and then I might also submix things in stereo pairs to one machine. And then this allows me to have the flexibility of working on someone else's project in digital while I'm simultaneously working on my albums in analog. Moving over, uh, this is the instrument that I started out on. And this is the actual, the one that I bought in uh, the late 80s. It is a vintage ARP 2600 synthesizer. I met a gentleman back in the late 80s named Dave Thompson, and he used to have a little column in the back of Keyboard Magazine called Synth Locator. Immediately called it and said, hi, do you have any ARP 2600s? And you know, he's like, oh, no. And at the time, these weren't really sought after. Everybody wanted the DX7s and they wanted the Rollins and Korgs and things like that. Long story short, he was very kind and invited me up to his place. So I drove four, almost five hours, but I got to experience a world of synthesizers. He had everything. He had a large Moog system, he had a pair of 2600s, he had Mellotrons, he had an amazing collection. About three months later, he called me and said he had an ARP 2600 for me. And so, I wasn't able to afford it right off the bat, but he let me make a down payment. And in about three, four months, he called me and said, well, you better come get this thing or I'm gonna have to sell it to Lenny Kravitz. He's on the other line and wants to buy it. And I told him, well, Lenny can call me and he can rent it from me. I'll be up tomorrow. So I sold my car and a few other things and I hitched a ride with a friend up to get it. And that's where it all began. I'll give you a little sample of the 2600s just because they sound so good. So these things are great for everything. Delicate solo voices to crushing bass. It's beautiful for winds and just low end frequency that you want just to feel like you're in another space or another universe. Unlike other integrated systems, they have a lot of crosstalk, which is kind of a beautiful thing. I mean, and it's not what you strive for when you're making a discrete module synthesizer system. But I think when Alan R. Perlman and his team developed this instrument, they embraced the fact that it had some unique subtleties, and that's part of what's beautiful about the 2600. The way that each of the oscillators work together, either as a sound source or a modulation source, you have these very fine-tuning possibilities along the way. 
So it makes just for some very interesting and beautiful stereophonic sound. One of the secrets of synthesis is how you mix, and you can mix right in these things. Going back to the, the tape demonstration, you know, a lot of those crazy sounds and effects were either just two of 2600s or other tapes going through the 2600s being manipulated. They're beautiful instruments. Using lots of different instruments, my goal with it was to learn more how to orchestrate music and how to understand the role of other musicians in a bigger picture. Also, by the time I was a teenager, I had to make money. So it was a way of making a living, playing various things, and if the drummer didn't show up or the bass player was too intoxicated, I could immediately jump in and it gave me an opportunity to be a shapeshifter in each musical situation. So I just developed a, you know, a pretty good grasp of a lot of different instruments. But all the way through it, I've always been into electronic sound and shaping my sound and combining this sort of marriage of musical orchestration and the awareness of psychoacoustic activity in the music. I'd like to take a moment to talk about my workspace and these benches that are in here. Um, when I moved out here, I had a very specific idea about how I wanted to set things up so I could um, work very quickly and efficiently. So I called up a good friend of mine who's also in Akron, Ohio, named Chad Brevelin. He owns a company called Akron Hardwoods. Chad's a real talent, a musician, artist, uh, and he's an amazing craftsman. And he built uh, the cabinetry for this synthesizer, and he built all the custom workbenches that you see all throughout here and it's he's really amazing there's a lot of heavy expensive equipment in here so he made all these keyboard garages everything so he's a real gift all right now this is my favorite system in here to compose and to create soundscapes this is a custom Moog system and it is a, an amazing system at that many of you guys know out there that I'm a huge supporter of Moog and work with them on a lot of projects. They're amazing humans to work with. So much attention to detail and artistry. And heart. And they're a company with heart. And when you use their instruments and really apply your musical attentions to them, that, that evidence is very clear. So what this system is, is starts with the Moog One, and this is where I do polyphonic stuff, sequencing, and just a lot of multiple signals out into the system. The Moog One is a really special instrument, and I do a lot of composing patches for the Moog One. So when you get a firmware update, chances are um, there is a plethora of sounds that I've crafted in here. It's a mammoth system. It's essentially a full modular system with polyphonic control under one hood. This is an original Moog 3P. And so this is the, one of the last made of the 3P. And it is the original Bob Moog design. Every component is all handmade in Asheville, North Carolina. There is just something to it. It has a spirit. It has immense power and versatility and it is a joy to work with. The filters, the oscillators, the envelope generators are just second to none. There's just nothing else like it. There's a lot of things that have tried to copy it, but there's a reason it's one of the most classic synthesizers out there. On top I have my own custom built 5U modular and it has a bunch of different manufacturers in there and it allows me to sort of have further uh, modulation possibilities with the original Moog sound. When this was made, if you just wanted to have certain modulation, you had to take up an oscillator which took up voices of sound. So I've put this together to sort of help allow me to explore the sound of the original Moog in such a unique way. 
Let me give you guys a little demonstration of this beautiful instrument. So ever since I started making albums of my own, these two instruments have been there from the beginning. This was actually the very first synthesizer I ever bought, and this is an ARP Omni stereo polyphonic synthesizer. And this is the ARP String Ensemble, 1975-1976. Uh, I call the String Ensemble the Sky Machine, because as soon as you put in one note, it just opens the clouds to any sound. It's such a bright, sibilant and frothy, buzzy sound in the lower registers. And then what's cool about the Omni is that it's simple technology. It's essentially another string ensemble, but it's also a simple analog synthesizer that's paraphonic. And then I can hook up things from the gates and the envelopes into the back of the Omni and have things get triggered. So it almost feels like a poly sequencer. The ARP Axe is another one that I love to use in correlation with the Omni. Mo Grandmother, to me, is one of the best synthesizers ever made as well. It's just a perfect integrated system. And when this thing came out, it just I just couldn't believe how amazing it sounded. And I love the beautiful connectability with Eurorack and my ARP 2600s. And you just can't do any wrong with the Grandmother. I love it. Coming over here, it's an old 1976 Poly Moog. And then this is the Moog 3P controller. So this also controls the Moog modular. And then my favorite solo synthesizer, Mini Moog Voyager. One of the things I love about the Mini Moog Voyager is you have a row of controls on top that once again, you can interconnect these instruments together and create stereophonic movement and stereo drama. Yeah, pedals. I love pedals and I love incorporating them into my mixes and experimenting with other sounds. I love committing to tape with pedals and effects. You know, a lot of people don't like to commit and they like to do things in post, but I think it's important to leave your work as it should sound. And if somebody gets your tapes years down the line and there's no effects on it, then that's not part of the sound. With Earthquaker Devices, I've known and worked with the company since its inception. 
uh, known Jamie since the early 90s and used to play punk house shows together and developed a friendship and great respect. Jamie made me some of the first prototypes of Earthquaker devices in the very beginning. I love to use things like the Rainbow Machine, the Arpanoid, the Grand Orbiter is always patched in somewhere. And my favorite one is the Avalanche Run. I have a custom rack mount version and it's directly patched into my console. So it's really nice to be able to take both of those and invert phase and get combinations going on with filtering and it just sounds great. It has a beautiful space and it's one of my favorite reverbs still. It's one of my most used for sure. So this is really cool. I dug these out for your guys' visit. These are the very first two prototypes Jamie Steelman made for me when Earthquaker devices began. And I'm trying to remember what each of them are. I know this was the very first one he made me. I was asking for a Marshall Governor and a Bifet preamp. So it's a an overdrive and a boost. It sounds amazing. You know, it's just a real smooth, rich, rich sound. I would say it's like a talons with lots more gain and more volume on the out end. Sounds amazing, still sounds amazing. It's been beat up by the road, but it still works. And then this was one of the first fuzz pedals that I know that he was making. I don't remember what the breadboard is, but it's the best for bass, bass synthesizer. It just crushes. And so I would use this on more doom guitar type stuff and also use it with synthesizers. Yeah. Love you, Jamie. Well, my favorite instrument of all time is the Fender Rhodes electric piano. It was where all of the rest of it began. And there's just something about sitting down at a Fender Rhodes and composing a piece of music that just connects you with the earth tones of the music. I don't know if that sounds weird, but that's how I feel about it. When you amplify it, you add echo, you add reverb and phasing. It just turns into this whole other atmosphere that it's very picturesque and allows to create beautiful harmonic movement as well as just playing it like a piano. Behind me is my library of 8-track tapes. What really made me go wild with collecting them was hearing a lot of popular albums that I loved, again, in a totally unique way, especially jazz albums. They're not a consistent medium, but they definitely have this amazing quality when they've been taken care of or been refurbished. And I have a lot of different titles, some very coveted, a lot of your classics, but it's just a great way to listen to music. I'm very passionate about mediums of music. That's why I love tapes, I love LPs, and all the tape mediums have a different transient response, they have a different tone, they have a different presence, and you just hear the same music in a new way each time, even with digital. And especially when digital first came out, uh, listening to digital tape for the first time was just remarkable. And it's still remarkable. I, my, one of my recent albums called Morning Light, which was a live recording, I did on a Tascam DA20 digital audio tape. And it's just phenomenal sounding. So even if it's digital tape, there's something that happens. There's some sort of cosmic experience that happens for me every time I get to hear a new impression of the music. These are my two favorite eight track tapes that I have. The first one is a Thierry Ripdahl, Miroslav Vito, and Jack De Jeanette from 1979 on ECM Records. This tape is amazing and it just has this sonic image that sounds different than any other medium. Uh, my second favorite tape of all time, Ramsey Lewis, Don't It Feel Good To You. You know, I have the vinyl of this. Nothing sounds like it. It just comes out of the speakers like they're in your living room. And it's a, it just makes you feel amazing. A lot of your viewers will probably love this. And this sounds amazing on 8-track. Some David Bowie Low. Of course, I'm a huge fan of 
Tangerine Dream, and so I have most of the releases they ever did on 8-track. This is a great soundtrack if you've never heard it. Another great one, Ornette Coleman, Skies of America, a masterpiece album, and um, definitely comes out of the 8-track spectrum in an extremely unique way. John Coltrane, Expression. I mean, we could be here all day. So with this little room, this is where a lot of gear just kind of ends up. But I also try to come in here and occasionally do some projects. This is my original studio setup, which was a Tascam 388. And this is my third one of these. And an MR16, I believe, is this board. It sounds great. It is beat up. It's been through so many homes and lives. But this 388 still works like a charm, and I've done a lot of my albums with it. One of my recent vinyl releases called The World She Wanted was done on this machine. This was my third one that I bought from Daddy's Junkie Music in New Hampshire, and it used to belong to the Eurythmics, so it was said when I bought it. When I worked at the Jingle Studio, they got tired of me bringing all this old junk into their state-of-the-art studio, so they set me up a little tiny room about this size, and um, they gave me a 388 to start with. And I had this, I had a, ta a TAC two-track rotor reel and just a couple of ARPs and Moogs and, of course, Fender Rhodes. It was a great way to get started. I started collecting records when I was really little and I still have some of the ones I started out with. But I'll just show off some of my favorites. I would say my all-time favorite record is this one. And that's the original soundtrack to Night of the Living Dead. It's several different composers that make the music on this album. Ib Glindemann, Spencer Moore, George Hormel. And the sound was produced by Carl Hardman. And he would take the orchestrations and run some of them through an echoplex and things like that. This album had so much to do with my drive to be a composer. When I was, I think, 12, I discovered the film and the music, and so I took the VHS tape and recorded it onto a cassette, and I used to walk around back roads, countrysides, go into the wilderness at night with it in the headphones and just experience it in a very unique way. I still get goosebumps just even talking about this album. It's my favorite of all time. This is one of my favorite signing cassettes, Dave Weckl Master Plan. It's an amazing record. Uh, the title track written by Chick Corea is a tour de force composition. There's such an amazing space to it and the way that it comes off of cassette is just so powerful and beautiful. I love it. In consideration to a lot of Earthquaker viewers, this is another album that everybody should know if they don't. And that's Confessors Condemned. And this is an extremely talented quintet from North Carolina. Their whole idea behind composing is unique, uh, recommended. Occasionally I like to listen to albums on Reel to Reel, and this is one of my favorite albums of all time, and that's Miles Davis' Bitches Brew. I played it recently on a Saturday night, front to back. It is just phenomenal. This album had a huge impact to me first hearing it. And it was really the first album I ever heard by Miles Davis. He is quite possibly one of the most fearless musicians that ever lived because he reinvented himself over and over and over and stood behind everything that he did to the end. And I can't say that there's a period of Miles Davis that I don't love. So uh, this is something I'm very grateful to have. And this is possibly my favorite musician of all time, and that's Alan Holdsworth. Alan Holdsworth was a British musician, played with a lot of groups and ensembles, and then moved to the United States and started a solo career. This is a very rare, uh, precious album because it has all of his later discography, which is something that I have begged to have on vinyl. It was never released other than in this box set, which is about half of the discography. 
And you know, the thing about Alan Holdsworth is he achieved what Miles Davis used to claim that most musicians should strive for, and that is to be cliche free. He basically developed his own math of harmony and his own sort of rhythmic approach to music. And he's just a very special musician and without a doubt one of the fastest guns to ever play a guitar. And someone that, another fearless musician, he took guitar synthesizer into places that had never went. Just crossed so many, so many different bridges with music. He's um, definitely dear to me. So, Alan Holdsworth. This is my original copy of this album. And this is, without a doubt, my favorite rock record of all time, Merciful Fate, Melissa. This was one of the only records that my mother was a little concerned about after reading all the song titles. But I put it on and I had never heard such urgency in a rock record. It flew so far beyond than just the awesome and dark themes that are in here. But there was these amazing arrangements and just guitar solo after guitar solo and just, it sounds like a live band in a room. This is exactly what has vanished from heavy metal music is just a live band that can play their asses off and are urgent about what their music is about. This is an amazing document of that. And it's etched in my bone marrow. And also, it's etched in my arm. So, Merciful Fate, Melissa, 1983. One of the best records of all time. This is the first 8-track player that I was talking about earlier where I discovered the 16mm sound. I have some of the best 8-tracks up here. This is one of my favorite 8-track tapes for a Friday night. Ozzy Osbourne, Speak of the Devil. It's pretty hard to find and it really sounds amazing. It's one of the best mixes he ever had, I would say. Iron Maiden Killers is a great album. And uh, Twilight Zone is one of my favorite. Twilight Zone and Prodigal Son are probably my two favorite Iron Maiden songs. This is an amazing album, Rush, Grace Under Pressure. And it's definitely hard to find on 8-track. Probably one of my most played up here, and that's Tangerine Dream, Phaedra. It's pink. Who doesn't love some pink? Gary Wright, Dreamweaver. And this was really how I fell in love with electronic sound. My mom loved this album and used to blast it. And so ever since that she's been gone, my mom, I, uh, every first snow I play this album. Nice and loud. I don't expect that too many people will understand. <laughs> I love this album. I do love a lot of old country and western, and this has a lot of my favorite country and western artists, Charlie Pride, Ronnie Millsap, uh, Jerry Reed, Dolly Parton. There's so much just like raw energy and just talking and the way they talk to each other on stage is adorable. And it's just a great album. It's got a lot of excitement. So yeah, you know, it goes on and on, but this is a nice uh, place to get out of the uh, summer heat. It's also a great place to watch the snow fall in the winter time and listen to some tapes, read some books. It's pretty much what I'm doing when I'm not making music. I'm a recording artist and a composer and those are my two main passions in music. And with that comes having the equipment that facilitates that intention. And so when I come in here and I'm surrounded by all this electricity and all this equipment and it's, you know, daunting to a lot of people, to me there's many years of developing the logic for it. You know, there's a reason in this sort of like momentum that I get from each signal path. And each signal path becomes another part of the music. Some of these instruments I've had for 35 years. You know, and they're just part of my sound. You know, the ARP 2600s have been with me from the beginning. The ARP String Ensemble, the ARP Omni, 
huge part of my sound. The Mini Moog, they've always been there. That's become part of the sound that I hear in my head when I'm composing or I'm thinking about how I'm going to create an album. So three years ago, uh, we moved out here from the city and it's just been a great experience in a whole other sort of personal calibration of both my business and my family. And I have a nine-year-old daughter and it's really been great watching her grow up out here and to make this part of her foundation was just as important to me as being able to work here and have this as my main place to work. We we're basically in a valley out here. We go out and explore and there's tons of different wildlife out here and it's just a very inspiring place to live and I'm very connected to this area. When I was living in the city, things got really bad. And I just continued to manifest and to sort of focus on what I wanted and what I wished for and what I felt would better my life, better my abilities as a parent, better myself as a musician, better myself as just a human being. And when I found this place, it was exactly out of my dream, if you will. You know, all of the wood, all of the windows, the angled ceiling, and it's not too big. I like things to be cozy. I like economy of movement, just like any musician. You know, I like there to be this sort of immediacy of being able to get really close to my equipment and to the music itself. There's not a day that goes by that I'm just not super excited to be in here working.